I have shortly talked about one trend in 90s when it comes to using metabolic networks for simulations, and that was the representation of biomass reaction in terms of metabolic precursors. This way, you don't have to write those re reactions that shows how the building blocks such as amino acids, fatty acids, nucleotides, etc. are synthesized from precursor metabolites. So you really decrease the size of uh, your metabolic network. The number of reactions are really uh, decreased with this approach. Another trend in 90s was to lump the reactions. So here you see from glucose to, for example, those diphosphate, there are three reactions, right? And each uh, are controlled by different genes. So in those models in 90s, we didn't have those gene associations most of the time. So rather than writing this reaction in three steps, the tendency was to write it as a single reaction. So if you sum up all those, these will cancel, these will cancel. So you can write this as one glucose plus two ATP is going to one fructose diphosphate plus two ADP. So such lumping was very popular in the metabolic network models in 90s. You know, because we didn't have any transcriptome or related data in those years, so there wasn't any point in adding the gene information to those uh, metabolic network models. So rather than writing reactions one by one, since there wasn't any high throughput omics data to map on those metabolic networks, uh, there was this lumping, as you see, you can show the upper glycolysis, the six carbon stage, as a single reaction. Similarly, from glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to pyruvate, you can again lump, combine the reactions as a single reaction. So that's why if you check the paper from 90s, you will see that there are like 20, 30, 50 reactions in those models. Because, as I said, first, the biosynthetic reactions were not there because biomass reaction was written in terms of metabolic precursors. Second, uh, most of the reactions were in lumped format. One other trend in the 90s in some papers was to not to show ADPs or NADs in the models. Maybe it is a bit difficult to uh, uh, tell you why. Uh, here, uh, because we didn't yet talk about the balancing in the mathematical formulation of simulation of metabolic networks, but uh, since, you know, we have, if we have two ATP here, we will have two ADP here. If we have five ATP here, we will have five ADP here. So they have both ATP and ADP, they carry the same information. So that's why this repetitive information was dropped from those models. It's okay if you don't fully grasp this, you will understand better when we switch to the mathematical formulas. Now, I will talk about one other important point to write, to, to finalize your metabolic network model. And these, this is the incorporation of growth-associated maintenance and non-growth-associated maintenance, sometimes abbreviated as, as GAM or NGAM. Indeed, we already shortly talked about growth-associated ATP maintenance, but I didn't use, use this term when I was talking about this. You will understand what I mean now. But first, let's see the generic list of steps if you want to 
use a metabolic network for phenotypic behavior simulation. Within this week, we have covered the first, we are covering the first three. We will cover the other ones in the coming week. So first, you need to construct a list of reactions. Second, you need to add a biomass reaction, either from micromolecular synthesis or from building blocks or metabolic precursors. And three, you need to consider growth associated and non growth associated ATP requirements. So we'll talk about this step now. What is growth associated ATP requirement? This is the ATP required for the polymerization of macromolecules and growth. So I have already shown you this table, right? So we have those macromolecules. This is from yeast Saccharomyces cerevisia. These are big molecules. So a lot of amino acids have to come together to make a protein, for example. And this requires energy. So protein synthesis from its building block amino acid or nucleic, nucleic acid synthesis from nucleotides, they are energy required processes. So this table shows that for Saccharomyces uh, cerevisia, the energy required for the polymerization of macromolecules is 24 millimole ATP per, per gram cell. And this is what we refer as growth associated ATP requirement. This ATP is required for growth, for the synthesis of macromolecules. But energy is also required for the maintenance of the cell uh, for the survival in these. So this is not for energy required for growth or for uh, anabolic reactions or for catabolic reactions, etc. This is the energy for uh, the maintenance of the cell other than the growth uh, processes. And this energy is referred as non-growth associated ATP maintenance. And compared to the growth associated maintenance, this is uh, much lower. For Saccharomyces cerevisia, for example, the value used in literature is 1. For E. coli, it's a little bit higher, between 5 and 8. And this figure nicely shows the relationship between growth-associated maintenance and non-growth-associated maintenance. If you plot growth data obtained from chemostat growth experiments from microorganisms. Let's say uh, you have a, a certain growth rate, a certain dilution rate or growth rate, and for that growth rate, you have quantified the required ATP already. You can do this for a lower growth rate, for a lower growth rate, and if you fit a line to this data, you will see that this line doesn't cross from the point zero. So even the growth is zero, kind of zero, there's no growth, the cell still needs some ATP. So this is the ATP referred as non-growth associated maintenance. Uh, and uh, so if you have experimental data, from the slope of this line, you can read growth associated maintenance value for that organism. And from the intercept, you can read NGAM, non growth associated ATP maintenance requirement for your organism. So, in summary, uh, I have shortly talked about this. There are databases of organism specific metabolic reactions from K, from Biosac. If you go to those databases, you can select your organism of interest and you can see all catabolic and anabolic reactions specific for uh, those organisms. Only you won't see any biomass reaction or any uh, non growth associated ATP maintenance reaction, etc. You need to add them 
uh, by yourself. This is an example, a screenshot from EcoPsych website, for example, a uh, metabolic network database for the organism Escherichia coli. Here you can see nicely the metabolic reactions. So here glutamate is converted to glutamate 5-phosphate. You can see the related enzyme EC number, enzyme name, or you can also see the name of the gene. You also see if the reaction is uh, utilizing any ATP or not. These are all clickable. You can click on the metabolite names, EC numbers, enzyme and uh, gene names to get further information. And you can also click here to see the pathways that produce glutamate in detail. Here you see the same pathway. If you click here more detail, you will see the same pathway with more details, such as chemical structures. As you see now, you see the chemical structures of your metabolites. So uh, this biopsych pathways, ecopsych is one of the biopsych pathways, and also cake. They are commonly used uh, as a template to make organism-specific metabolic networks that can be used for simulations. So today we have covered those three steps and next week we will focus on the rest that will help us simulate metabolism by using this approach. Before ending uh, this lecture, I want to share with you uh, one reference book regarding this metabolism, catabolic reactions, and anabolic reactions, the, the uh, pathways I have reviewed today. And you have already noticed that occasionally I have shared tables from this uh, book, also some figures. So, Metabolic Engineering Principles and Methodologies, the book by Stefano Plos, Aristotle and Nielsen. So, the figures and tables I shared today was from Chapter 2 of this book, Review of Cellular Metabolism. So, if you want to learn more about catabolic reactions, anabolic reactions, the relationships, I strongly recommend you to read Chapter 2 of the Metabolic Engineering book.